Good afternoon. When was the last time you asked yourself the question, I wonder why Christ has not returned yet? Well, I hope to answer that question from our text today. There's one bad, sinful reason why Christ has not returned that some mockers and scoffers have said the reason why Christ has not returned yet. Yet there are three reasons why Christ has not yet returned. So take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll read verses 1 through 9 and our meditation, if you will, our consideration will be verse 9. This is the word of God. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, obviously in the Old Testament, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Here is their question that they're asking, or the reason why Christ has not returned. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, that's the creation, by which the world that then existed perish, being flooded with waters, as the flood where Noah built the ark. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years And a thousand years as one day. Here's our verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Amen. And we trust that God will add his blessing to his word. Well, instead of just dropping right down into the passage, I want to little introductory work here, and that is a little bio of Peter, the one who wrote this, and then we'll look at some background to uh, the verses that lead up to verses, that verse 9, and when you consider Peter, you ask any Christian, and that's probably one of their favorite characters of the Bible, a man that actually did live, you use the word character, some people jump to an Aesop fable, this man actually did exist, and he's quite a character, He really is. He's a fisherman, so he's a rough dude. He didn't, you know, he doesn't, he didn't push pencils or paper around. He didn't have soft hands. He was a rough fisherman, and at that time, the reputation was these are really rough guys with their mouth as well as with their actions. They were gruff men, and yet our Lord chose him and chose him to follow him as well as to be a preacher. He was one of the 12 apostles. He was also, there's only one other man other than our Lord that walked on water, and that was Peter. Peter walked on water. He also has the distinction of being the only one that our Lord called Satan. No other man got called that except Peter. He got called Satan. He was a man of extremes. When our Lord is getting ready to wash the feet of his followers, he comes to Peter. Peter doesn't have anything to do with it. Oh, no, you're not going to do that. You're much too, you're much too holy for, than, than for that to happen. He didn't want any of it. And then the Lord said, well, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. Okay, Give it to me all. You know, he just goes from one extreme, nothing at all, to give me 15 gallons of water. That's the way Peter is. Mighty indeed. He, he was just mighty indeed. And so you go from him wanting our Lord to wash his feet, and he goes and hacks off a servant's ear in Gethsemane when they're coming to take our Lord, right? And then it's not very long after that he denies our Lord three times. And... He's also restored. John 21. Campbell will eventually get to that, probably in the year 2050, but it'll be somewhere in that neighborhood. He goes through books a lot faster than I would or Sam does. But you know, see, you see how, how Peter is restored back into the Christian ministry. He's mighty in his preaching. In Acts chapter 2, he preaches to the first Gentiles, Cornelius. 
He preaches to them, and yet he's reproved by Paul for being the hypocrite. He's, he's amazing. He's, <laughs> I think for us as Christians, we see how God takes the worst of people and he saves them, just like he did with Peter, this rough fisherman, a man here who had faith and doubt, who had humility and zeal without knowledge. And just, you know, it's just wonderful. I was raised a Roman Catholic, so I always thought of him as the first pope. He's not. He's not the first pope. He's not the head of the church. He's also not a priest. He was married. Luke chapter 4 bears that out. He elevated the word of God above tradition. He preached in faith in Jesus Christ alone for the salvation of sinners. And all believers, all of us as believers, have a priesthood. Not in the Old Testament way where we're offering up sacrifices. That's what goes on today with some of these papist priests. They're offering up sacrifices. That's an affront to God. But we as believers, we come in here operating as priests as we offer up thanksgiving to God. The sacrifice of our, our praise goes before God, and here we operate as priests. And Peter spoke from experience on um, being a good husband as well as a good pastor. Well, that's the biographical replay of Peter, and I think a lot of us identify with him. Just amazing how God takes men like that, turns them into preachers, turns them into Christians. Well, I want you to notice here in Second Peter, secondly, by way of introduction, this short epistle is written to believers. And Peter begins at the very start in verse 1 about the righteousness that's found in Christ. And he continues on to want to remind the believers because he knows that his end is coming soon. He knows he's going to have to die. He wants to make sure he leaves something behind to be of help to God's people. He also brings out in the first chapter how he witnessed and saw the Lord's transfiguration, how God the Father had approved of the Son. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And Peter recounts this to his, to his uh, believers here that are reading his, his letter. We have the inspiration of the word of God that's brought out, how holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's the first chapter. second chapter, Peter wants to deal with false teachers. And there's a lot of similarities to what Peter says here in, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and what Paul said to those uh, uh, Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 about how there's going to be wolves that will come in seeking to destroy the flock, and Peter uses very similar language in chapter 2. When we come to chapter 3 now, we're going to take a look at the reason why Christ has not returned yet, but again, by way of introduction, and I'm just going to run through verse 1 through 8 ever so quickly, one or two sentences, and that's it. That will hopefully set up for verse 9, so we can get to the answer of reason why Christ has not returned yet. But Peter, again, he reminds him in verse 1. He says, this is the second time I'm writing this to you. I'm doing this so you might remember what I'm about to tell you. Verse 2, he says that the words of the prophets in the Old Testament and the words of the apostles in the New Testament, they all agree about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm not telling you anything new. This is something that you're already aware of. And then he says in verse 3 that scoffers are going to come with no fear of God, with their lusts leading them, and asking the question, where is the supposed return of Christ? Remember, Christ ministers in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament proclaim a destruction of the earth, the second coming of the Lord, the dreadful day of the Lord. And so they are just making fun of it. These scoffers are. Verse 5, Peter gives a commentary on them. He says, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens basically were made in water, out of water. You forget that all God had to do was speak, and it came about. The world that we see, this wonderful world that we see. And he made the stars, the earth, and all that is in it. That same word also brought about the flood, Peter says. Noah, only eight were spared. So you have a world that is filled with unbelief, and God had had it. And he destroys everyone except eight. And then Peter says, this I want to remind you of. And it seems like the scoffers knew something about God. They knew something about creation, knew something about the flood. Because he says, okay, 
That same word that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, that same word that destroyed the earth with a flood, that same word is reserved for a day of great judgment, of great fear, where there will be destruction that will come and all the ungodly will be destroyed. Fire, perdition. That's what he's talking about here, for the ungodly men. And then in verse 8, he, he, it, it, it's almost as like if Peter says, okay, let's stop here for a moment. Okay, beloved, I just want you to remember one thing. One day is as a thousand years in the eyes of the Lord, and a thousand years is as one day with God. Now, we only judge things by 24-hour periods. And for us, sometimes it seems like a really long time. I know when I was little, it just seemed like forever to get to eight years old or nine years old or 10 years old. I mean, that was decades ago. And now, you ask me, I saw, I would say, it was there for a moment, now it's gone. Uh, and we're on the downside of our career, so to speak, for those of us that are really old like me. We're on the downside. But, you know, in the eyes of the Lord, just one day or a thousand years to our Lord because of his patience is not, if I could use this in a very reverent way, it's not a big deal to our Lord. A thousand years, one day, this is to teach the patience of God. Now, we get to verse 9, hopefully setting this up. And this verse 9 answers the objection found in verse 4, which says, where is the promise of his coming? And it's almost as if, these scoffers are saying, you're preaching this, and look at everything just continues the way it is. So what do you have to say about that? So Peter says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. So here, when we look at verse 9, the question that has to be answered is, why has Christ not returned? Because of what has been preached in the past, in Old Testament, New Testament, even in our day of age of the year 2018. Remember, there's two groups of people in verse 9. There's the scoffers and there's the us. There's that new TV show, This Is Us. This is us. Okay, there's scoffers and then there's the us. One reason or assumption that Christ has not come back is wrong and it is sinful. And yet, there are three answers why Christ has not returned yet. So, it's not because of this, that God is slack, lazy, and forgetful, but it's because of these three reasons, that he has not returned yet. So, let's take a look at the first ungodly assumption. And he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That's what they were saying. Uh, it's an assumption, what they're saying is God is dull, he's slow, he's quiet, he's sluggish, he's lazy, he is disinterested, he is tardy, he's a procrastinator, he's distant from his creation, and I doubt there really is a God that's going to come back. That's what they are assuming. They misjudge God by their current situation. I've heard of fools saying, I'm going to live forever, so far so good. And people laugh. But I sat back saying, what a fool. What a fool to, to think that you're going to live forever here on this earth when all you have to do is look at the history of man. And this just in, 100% of people that are born, they have to die. Now, God's promise that he will indeed return in flaming fire is still inactive, and it's something that was preached. When you look at Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 24, this is what our Lord t taught. He said, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, Remember elect, it has a lot to do with this verse. Election has a lot to do with this, work, with this word. His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That is what our Lord taught. Remember when our Lord ascended on high? The, the, the apostles are looking up into heaven. The angel comes and says, This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The Lord will indeed return. When Paul is preaching to a bunch of, a bunch of unbelievers on, on Mars Hill, these guys that like to hear anything that's new, this is what he preaches to them. 
as he summarizes his gospel. He says, because he, that's God, has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man, he had preached Christ to them, whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. So, unlike man, God is going to keep his promise. He's going to send his son to judge the ungodly. And these mockers dare to charge God with being slack, with being quiet or forgetful, as if God had a whoops. Whoops, I forgot. That's, un- that's unthinkable. The mockers may judge God tardy by their senses, but the end is not yet. It does matter what goes on now, but there is going to be an end. And that's a promise that God has made. God is most mindful of his promises. Peter will answer the question why the Lord has not returned yet, because these mockers thought that God was tardy, and they only thought of themselves. And it wasn't because of truth, it's because of their lust and their passions. Most people that do not believe upon the Lord may make an excuse about the fact that, you know, I'm, I don't believe this stuff because of all the scientific evidence or whatever they may say. The real, reason, the real reason why they won't come to Christ is they love their sin. They're being led by their lusts and passions. Because when you come to Christ, you must hate your sin. You must hate it. And I think that's what they were doing here. Just a facade, just something to distract the people. Where's the second coming? God is slack. Well, here's the three reasons why Christ has not returned. Yet... Because of patience, because of patience. As it says here, is long-suffering toward us or toward you. So he's talking about those current believers right there. The reason why Christ has not returned, and I want you to notice again, there's a difference between mockers and the us. He's long-suffering towards the us, the current believers. When we are converted, do not think that God is done with us. That's just the beginning of our process of holiness, of sanctification. And if a gospel is preached, you come to Christ, and then after that, there's no pursuit of holiness, that's a bad gospel. Because God has something intended when he saved all of us, the us here in this passage, that we would be conformed more to his son's image. And God is going to do that in the process of time. And because of the fact that he has this in mind for us, he's not going to send his son. He's not done yet with us. Well, how our growth in grace is, whether it be a couple steps forward and three back, nevertheless, Christ is not coming back. God's not going to send his son back until that work that God has determined before time began is accomplished in us. God has determined this for our good. It's a process of holiness that's still going on. So the reason that Christ has not come back is because God has forgot the promises, but he's long-suffering towards us. That's the first thing. The second reason why the Lord Jesus has not come back yet is that he's not willing that any should perish. Any should perish. There are those that are going to believe this gospel. Christ is not going to come back until those that are going to believe this gospel believe. And here I would insert the word, the elect. Those that are elect in Christ Jesus, those whom God chose before time began. Paul says in Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, having predestined us. So there is an election according to grace. When you look at John chapter 6, in verse 37, our Lord says, all that the Father gives me, will come to me, not may, will. So all that has been given to Christ will come to him, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me I should lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. In verse 65, our Lord says it best when he says, Therefore I have said to you, to those who did not believe, that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. should put the people in fear. 
Not this easy believism. You can believe upon Christ anytime you want. No, you must believe upon him now and plead with God to have mercy upon your soul. But he is long-suffering towards us, not willing of, the, of any of the us, any of the elect should perish, but they should have everlasting life. He's not willing that any of his elect should perish. And when you go to Mark, and when you read Mark, keep Peter in the back of your mind, because guess where Mark got his information regarding the Lord Jesus? He got it from Peter. When you look at Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 13, listen to what our Lord says. Beginning verse 19, for in those days there will be tribulations such as not been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those, di- shortened those days, why would he shorten those days? Unless he had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's safe, sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. So if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he's over there. Don't believe them, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. There's a difference. There is a difference between those that believe and those that do not believe. God regulates time. He regulates our salvation. God is willing for the chosen to be saved. And God is not weak or forgetful or arbitrary, We have our plans. God has his. In the course of time in history, the us should live. I use the word election. Now, let me caution us here right now. How do we know who the elect are? Well, God knows. And we say God's will be done. So what is God's will with regards to the elect? Well, it's his word that determines what is the will of God. Now, we see from Scripture that God doesn't take delight in the death of the wicked, but that he should turn from his ways. We also see that God is good. His goodness leads us to repentance. He causes the rain, the fall on the just and the unjust. Only the Lord knows, in one sense, who the elect are. But, you know, if a sinner comes to see his great need for Christ, we don't say, okay, wait a minute now. Before you profess faith in Christ, I just have one question for you. I want you to answer it for me. Are you elect? No, that's not the question to ask. That's the wrong question. Are you elect? Someone who comes under conviction and says, I'm not sure now because I'm a Calvinist. I want to make sure you know, I don't sin in this area. So you put a burden on saying, are you elect? That's not the right question. It's a stupid question. The right question is, do you see your need for Christ? Do you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Then come to him and receive him. That's the question. God does as he pleases. God is not frustrated. We have great confidence that our God is going to save to the uttermost. So he's long-suffering towards us, not willing of the us should perish. When Luther was, was debating Erasmus with regards to the will of man and the will of God, he said to Erasmus, he says, your God is too much like a man. Now, granted, we've been made in the image and likeness of God, but don't we dare put God into a box And make him think that he operates like we do. He is far above us. He is far greater than us. What we know of him is only a small corner. But this is a big corner. This is a real big corner. But it's just a corner of what we know of the Lord. So we need to be careful of using election as a battering ram against the Arminians. Because we need to come to Christ. We need to be found in Christ. Which leads us to our last point, the last reason why Christ has not yet returned, but that all should come to repentance. You see what, see what uh, Peter's done? He says he's long-suffering towards us, okay, us believers. He's not willing that any that are living should perish, okay, any of the elect should perish, but that all, let's go from beginning of Genesis to the Lord slams the door on creation. All. All of the elect would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that the elect will repent. They will believe. Repentance is absolutely necessary for the salvation of a soul. To not have repentance is not to have the Savior. 
Notice the mockers are busy mocking. They're not repenting. Brethren, if you find yourself in a mocking mood all the time or contentious instead of repenting, you need to repent of that. Repent of that. That's the, take this verse, that's how we would apply that, is that we are believing, we are repenting. That's the test of election. Do we repent? Do we believe? What are the us doing? Well, thankfully, we are not perishing in our sins. All of the elect will not perish in our sins. The elect repents. The elect believes. That change is necessary. So those are the three reasons, trying to be as brief as possible, making sure I don't go over my time. I know how it is after an afternoon, after you have lunch. It gets tough. So there's a bad reason why Christ, why the mockers would say why Christ has not yet returned. God's slack. He's lazy. There's three reasons why Christ has not yet returned yet. I want you to notice I didn't mention anything at all about Israel or rebuilding a temple or the gospel has got to be preached to every single one. You've heard that before. Okay. So if you're coming to that conclusion, which is based on an obscure verse, that Christ is not going to return until the entire gospel is preached to everyone, then you can get up tomorrow morning feeling very confident, saying, well, Christ is not coming back because the gospel has been preached to everyone. You need to be careful of, of using that mentality because that's not what the verse is saying. When you consider Acts chapter 2, the gospel being preached to all those souls there, that could be applied there. But here's three here are reasons why Christ has not returned yet. He's not done with us yet in terms of our holiness. Secondly, the elect need to be converted. And then thirdly, all of the elect needs to be converted. Then Christ returns. Well, I have some conclusions and applications here. I've got a couple of them. While the mockers of this day put the day of judgment far off and forgotten, they are the ones that are slack. They are the ones that are lazy. Though They are the ones that are sinning. Because they put that day of death far off. Let us not put that day far off. In verse 10, Peter tells his hearers, his readers, that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. It will come. It will come on a day that you do not expect it. No one can predict when Christ Jesus is coming back. Some have tried to do it, and they prove themselves to be false prophets and fools. No one can predict that day. Timing is not our timing. It's God's timing. God sets his time. He's already determined Christ is coming back. And will probably, for us, not to be surprised when the Lord comes back, pray every day. And when you end your prayers, say, Lord Jesus, please come back today. Because guess what? If he comes back, you're not surprised. Yeah, I just pray that. He's back. And you keep praying throughout your life. Well, he hasn't come back yet, but... That's okay because you realize the promise is not towards me alone, but also towards the elect. So we pray, Lord, please come back today. So if he comes back, we're not surprised. We will be shocked. Okay, we're not going to be sit there casually going, oh, the Lord came back. This is great. No, we, the, I mean, the experience is far greater than me preaching it. I mean, imagine the glory of, of Christ coming back in flaming fire, but it's to gather his elect. We're, we're rejoicing. We're, we're, we're shocked. This is great. Yeah, sure, I pray that, but I'm still stunned. This is wonderful. That's the hope of the Christian. So we currently, right now, look for new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, 2 Peter 3.13, 3, look for new heavens and a new earth. We are looking. The mockers are busy mocking. We are looking for that great day of the Lord. Distractions abound. Maybe we're getting closer to retirement. That's a distraction to me. Should I retire or not? Should I retire or not? Okay. You know, we all have to make that decision, and it's wise for us to take care of our families. But remember, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth. All this that we have accumulated will go to our families Right, we should. A godly man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. He should do that. But if the Lord comes back, we're not crying over it. Fine. Lord comes back. That's better than these riches that I laid up for my children's children. But distractions will abound, and therefore we need to take heed to ourselves that we are not led astray 
or to be a mocker. God's people can be affected by scoffers or else Peter wouldn't have warned them in verse 17 of the same chapter. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware. Remember, he's, he's, he's going to be dying soon. He wants to make sure his followers, his hearers are aware of this. He says, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, own steadfastness being led away with the air of the wicked. You listened to those mockers over and over again, and you got led astray. The Lord's coming back. Be patient. Wait. You are affected by those unbelievers around you. That's why we need to be in here every Lord's Day, so that we're affected properly. Things are brought into perspective. Nothing makes sense until we come into the house of God. Then we have an eternal perspective of things. Then we're able to put it together. This, yeah, the Lord's coming back. I lived in a world that says for six days a week, there is no God. He's not coming back. There's no judgment to come. Shut up, Rick. That's what you hear. You come in here, we hear preaching. And God puts things into perspective for us. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as is the custom of some. This is a good time for us to come into the house of God, to hear the word of God, So we're able to face Monday and pray differently. Lord Jesus, please come back. Not be led away, not be led astray. In Matthew 24, 45, verse 45. Then who is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Instead of mocking, he is so doing. As surely I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. Here's someone that appears to believe, but he thinks God is delaying. And so no one's looking. I'm going to sin. And that's what he does begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. He's hanging out with the wrong people. He's being with the wrong people. Instead of being in God's house, he's out getting loaded. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. Can it be that the Lord Jesus will come back on the Lord's day? I'm just asking a question. Don't you dare go outside this building and say, Rick says that the Lord's coming back on the Lord's day. I'm not saying that. I'm just posing a question. Can it be that he will return on the Lord's day? Just a simple question. He will come on a day when he's not looking for him. He should have been in church. And at at an hour when he is not aware of, there's a football game on. There's a family event. And will cut him in two, appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then our Lord in chapter 25 gives us the parable of the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. The wise ones were looking for our Lord. The foolish ones were sleeping. We have seen how long-suffering God is towards us. And I would say we should also be long-suffering with one another. Long-suffering with one another. God is doing a work within each one of us It may not be according to our timetable, but it's according to God's timetable. And that's the best way to look at it. Secondly, God's promises are not always positive. His promise of destruction will come to pass. When you look at verse 10, you see that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's the promise. That's not a good promise for the unbeliever. It's a dreadful day. That's what's called in the Old Testament, the dreadful day of the Lord, a day of great terror. The earth, imagine this big planet that we have is burned up with fervent heat. Christ Jesus comes back in flaming fire. Why? Why does the Lord have to come and completely burn up this earth. Three-letter word. Sin. Why do you think he destroyed the earth with the flood? Sin. 
Why do you think Christ is coming back? Will he really find this kind of faith on the earth? Sin. Gathers his elect. And that's not a positive promise, if you will. But it's something that God has intended. He has to do it because of his justice. He must do it. So in light of this, what type of people should we be? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The heavens will be dissolved. Fervent heat and fire. What type of people ought we to be? Holy conduct and godliness. Notice I didn't say what type of people. You, you, you. This is when we apply it to ourselves. What type of person should I be? I should be a holy man. I should be a holy man. You should be holy men. You should be holy women. Because of that. And therefore we should grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that doesn't come about accidentally. It comes about by effort. It comes about by faith. By repentance. So in conclusion... There is no peace from the mockers of our Lord, and there's no shortage of them. They will continue on. They've been around since the fall of man, but be encouraged, my brethren. God did not send the rain until his people were safe. Those eight were safe. The day of judgment depends not on the flow of time or some men's timetable or some strange idea that they've got, thinking that Christ is now going to return when this, that, and the other happens. But it's the hidden purpose of God. Hidden purpose of God. Natural man leads, lean towards impatience. But we as Christians have a different view of Christ's return. It's a blessed hope. The many years that we wait for the performance of the promise is a short time compared to eternity and the bliss that awaits us. And we will all say, I can guarantee you this, all of us that are here, Every elect one will say it was worth the wait. It was worth the wait. Therefore, we should give all diligence to make our call and election sure. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that all times are in your hand. You have determined our days, the day of our birth, the day of our death, And we praise you even our second birth. And we ask, O Father, you might grant unto us that grace of patience to be waiting upon you. We do pray, O Lord Jesus, that you would come back quickly. It would even be today. But we know that your coming back is according to the Father's wisdom, waiting for that last elect one to believe upon you. So we pray, O Father, that you would accept our worship this day. Encourage our souls as we go back to our normal duties of tomorrow that the unbelieving effects would not be detrimental to us, but we will walk with a holy eye towards you and towards your glory and towards your truth. We do indeed thank you for this Lord's Day. Look forward to the next Lord's Day, especially as we get to partake of the elements to remember the death of our Savior, the great price paid for our salvation. So hear our prayers. Do good to our souls. Seal this word to the saints here. May the messenger be forgotten. May the message be remembered. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.